So think about, you know, your roles and those that are listening to the podcast, think about your individual role now, whether you sit at board level, whether you sit at C-suite, mm. whether you sit for operations, it actually doesn't matter. What we're suggesting is that we're looking at the, the mental wellness piece in particular within organizations. We all have a responsibility. This does, doesn't sit with HR. So if there's a HR representative listening now, this is not solely on yeah. your head. This is on all of our heads. So what we're suggesting is that the corporate wellness and happiness becomes a core pillar to performance. So we start wrapping KPIs around this, for example. You know, we talk about the gross national happiness of countries, but what we're trying to do is embed that gross national happiness, but within organizations. Way to go, guys. Way to go. Keep it going. Good job, guys. All right, Paul. I see Hey there, it's Coach Girl here and welcome to episode 263 of the Today's Leader podcast, our final interview episode of 2020. I really just want to take some time to thank you for listening to the show as we have evolved during the year to focus more on leadership and business. We've had some amazing guests and I thank them for their time, their tips and their advice that they shared willingly and generously. Hopefully you have found the show to be be of benefit as you navigate this world of leadership in your business and organization. Today's guest is someone that I would simply describe as a world changer, a leader with a large vision wanting to be a positive impact in the world. Belinda Jane Dolan has recently graduated her first global cohort of chief happiness officers. And this project has the potential to revolutionize the ongoing culture and engagement of organizations. Belinda shares this exciting initiative and the science and the research that um, backs it, that underpins the development of it. As the CEO of Clarity, Belinda leads a team that works alongside companies, teams and leaders to create the happiest, most productive and motivated workplaces in the world. As a 17-time award-winning corporate wellness company delivering happiness and peak performance to companies right around the world. It was founded in Australia and they support change, corporate wellness and performance projects that drive employee engagement, happiness and deliver results for companies through their consulting practices, through peak performance coaching and impactful training. Clarity is certainly on a mission to create the happiest workplaces in the world and work across a range of industries from professional services, government, education, legal, financial, health and wellness, aged care, indigenous organisations, peak body, retail and hospitality. Today, you will hear how Belinda aims to create and drive a corporate happiness index similar to the Country Happiness Index that's currently available and ranks countries globally. Um, You'll also hear how happiness means creating a framework that adds value and creates a return on investment for businesses and how this framework creates stronger engagement and alignment for everyone in the organisation. Now, I enjoyed this conversation even though the internet gremlins and ghosts played their role. So Belinda is from Brisbane, but um, here in Queensland, like myself, but has been in Europe since COVID. Now, the internet the internet, did not play well. And the ghosts of Zoom meetings past certainly come back to haunt us. There's a couple of little squelches. There's a couple of times where the internet just didn't play the role that it should have. It doesn't affect the incredible things that, but, uh, that Belinda speaks to, of course but may at times be noticeable during your listening a pleasure. I hope that this doesn't diminish the the conversation, the discussion, and the framework itself. Um, without any further ado, please welcome Belinda Jane Dolan to the podcast. The podcast is brought to you by Think and Grow Business, the home of the Think and Grow Business Mastermind. If you're serious about growing your business, get serious and join a mastermind group today. 
Find out more at thinkandgrowbusiness.com.au. And it's my pleasure to welcome to the podcast. I've got Belinda Jane Doll. And Belinda, how are you? I am absolutely fantastic. Thank you, Tony. And what an honor to be here as well. Thank you so much for the invite. We're excited and pumped, ready to go. Absolutely. I, th- I thought you used the words ridiculously awesome when we first got online today. Ridiculously oh. awesome. Ridiculously awesome. We always are at Clarity. <laughs> okay. So I'm really excited to be talking with you because you've recently launched and um, a, a new program out there in the world and you recently now c- correct me any time that I'm wrong you put through the first group of cheap chief happiness officers is that correct it most certainly is and what an absolute honor to be able to talk about it so we we realized in business that we have chief executive officers we have chief marketing we have chief financial officers but where is the core of wellness and happiness and all of that? So we started a movement to create the happiest workplaces in the world, yeah. of which the happiness officer is one part of what we do at Clarity. And absolutely, you are 100% correct. It's the first of its kind in Australasia. And we were thankfully won a couple of awards last year and this year. And this year, November 2020 cohort, we put through the first Chief Happiness Officer certified in the UK, yeah. in Australia, and Malaysia too. So what wow. an exciting it's been. So has this been a continuation? So Clarity Group's been around for a while, um, correct? And so has this just been a culmination of, of the work that you've done, been doing? Yeah, that's a really, that's actually a really good summary. It's seven and a half years in the making. So we, you know, we've evolved as as an organization. And one of the things that we saw through a lot of the research that we're doing, we have our happiness at work surveys that we've been completing around the world. And we were seeing key themes coming up, Tony. And rather than just seeing key themes, I'm, I'm also a researcher in this field studying my PhD. So for me, when I see themes coming I'm always looking for solutions yeah and we said okay well let's collect the data first and let's you know let's have a real roundup of the data let's do some focus groups which we did we did some um you know some mind mapping with clients and we also went back out to industry and you know double check that data we'll talk about triangulation <laughs> of data we looked we said actually the data is great but what's actually happening on the ground so we realized that there were some gaps. We realized that wellness and happiness was being put on almost as an adjunct, as a yeah. nice add And often it wasn't being placed into the core of operations for a number of reasons. And, you know, we can go through those as we chat today. So we identified the reasons why that was actually happening and we put forward a solution. So, yes, it's an add-on to all the consultancy work we do in this space and, yeah, blessed to be able to get this out to the world. <laughs> and um, and I guess part of my experience sort of indicates to me that um, having an organisation with a chief happiness officer, for example, it would be quite challenging for some leaders to accept that as a role. I mean, and when we look at some of the behaviours out of organisations and businesses, people and culture seems to be lumped together and occasionally safety goes in with that because it's all people orientated and then as you were saying the health and wellness space seems to get tacked into that sort of area as well and then the operational team or task force or or leaders go off in their own merry way and expect the person heading up people and culture to be doing everything that to to embrace that people and culture so so i guess with that sort of a understanding how has the chief happiness officer and the work that you've been doing in this space been um received by some of the your clients and some of the 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 leaders that you deal with yeah and i i love that summary i just want to just pause and just highlight that summary and for those of you that are listening just go back press rewind on that summary because that's actually a really good um reason why we did what we did because we're finding that the the pieces of the jigsaw around wellness happiness the mental health space they're somewhat disconnected now i'm not suggesting in every organization in the world that's the case 
But what we found as a whole when we surveyed several thousand organisations is that it was very piecemeal, very scattered on. It went across human resources. It yeah. also touched on health and safety with one organisation, a very large retail-based organisation, actually within Australia. When we spoke to their HR department, they said, oh, that actually comes under health and safety, which was an interesting concept and a, and a piece around that. So taking a step back from you know the, the summary that you gave, that's exactly what we were finding. We were finding mental health and mental health um, within the workplace. Um, workplace was being added on. Then yeah. we were adding in the safety component, which is your, you know, your psychologically safe workplaces. And then we were adding on all the compliance focus, and we were starting to lose the core principles of okay, how can we design a wellness and happiness framework that actually builds organisations? So just just something going back to one of your points as well. Yeah. And the thing that came up for us is. We were also looking at the return on investment for companies because as you so rightly pointed out, organizations are often thinking, well, what's the point in having a chief happiness officer or a chief yeah. wellness officer? You know, Deloitte's and other big organizations have been doing this for a while. So we have to, you know, take a step back and, you know, and I'm obviously happy to talk about those as well because somebody, you know, listening to this podcast could really use um, you know, some of the data and evidence to say, actually, we do need not necessarily a full-time chief happiness officer, not yeah. necessarily a full-time chief wellness officer, but what companies do need is a framework around wellness and happiness, and that's what we've also developed as well. So, you know, there's a ton of information that I've got around the return on investment, but I'll pause there so we can chat some more. <laughs> So, so I guess the buy-in within organisations is going to be a little bit ad hoc or piecemeal or, or what have you, because ultimately, I'm, I would imagine, you know, I spent 29 odd years in um, senior leadership within retail businesses. So, so I know that if you don't own the culture as an operational leader, you don't get a culture. So, so I guess, or to get that buy-in around this this sort of program. What are, how, how do you talk through some of the benefits and that return on investment that organisations are obviously going to be looking for? Yeah, and look, and I love the fact that, you know, you, you're identifying that, you know, the wealth of experience you've got almost three decades. And even, you know, at a leadership level, we need to know that there is a return on investment. Yeah. Otherwise, it's just another bright, shiny object that yeah. we add into a team. But the culture piece goes beyond what we what we traditionally think as culture. I think now we're having to shift. If we look at the evolution of workplace wellness and happiness, and even the nature of work is now changing. Uh, and I've noticed that through you know through my own research yeah. and through my doctoral studies that it's evolving. So how we go about it is we purely look when we're looking at working with particularly boards. C-suite level, we look purely at the return on investment and not just the dollars, but, you know, the ability to, um, you know, increase individual performance, for example. Um, a great study by Children's Step to around 2008, they talk about high levels of well-being um, has been, you know, has been found to be, you, you'll get more creativity, you'll get yeah. more learning as an organisation, better relationships, pro-social behaviour better job performance yeah um, eight times more engagement you know the the world economic forum there's an economic foundation they they studied this for many many years and they talked about an eight percent increase in engagement wow. so if you think about that from a business perspective yeah. if i turn to you tony and you and i were working together and i said look i can get you from a retail perspective i can get you eight times more engagement and three times more productivity, um, you know, 32% reduction in on average safety claims. I'm hoping you would bite my hand off. Yeah, I'm thinking I'm, I'm at least listening, Belinda. <laughs> <laughs> and that's all we need. We need the responsiveness. We're not saying this is the be all and end all. Yeah. I'm not suggesting that we can turn businesses around with this. But if this is one component 
adding to the mix of this new this new environment that we're now faced within within organizations yeah. imagine if we could get a one percent or even a five percent increase in all of the those, you know those multiple factors that we just discussed so what i'm suggesting is let's at least start having the conversations and that's what we're, we're now at the stage with a lot of organizations is let's open the lines of communication yeah that's all we're suggesting that we're doing um you know and let's look at ways forward to create that higher levels of engagement you know relationships well-being and productivity as well so we've um talked about uh, i i suppose the benefits and um how you how you get that buy-in from organizations what is the chief happiness officer program based around is it like a positive psychology aspect or is it theoretical based research that's been happening yeah great question so everything that we do is is embedded within a scientific framework and scientific methodology yeah. and there's a reason for that because we've got a lot of researchers um, within our own um, team also as well so you're absolutely correct it's based upon positive psychology behavioral psychology there's elements of neuroscience in there as well from yeah. the work that we neuroscience uh, neuroscientist and also a performance counselor Behavioural economics is a really interesting one. We've okay. embedded components of that in. And now there's a reason for that. Organisations don't just embed or they shouldn't be embedding new programmes, new opportunities, without truly knowing the return on investment and not just from a dollar perspective. Yeah. We've taken a step back from that and looking from an economic perspective also as well. You know, if you're sitting on a board, I sit on a number of boards and committees, and before we start to embed new shifts, new changes, and to avoid change fatigue, which is a huge factor mm-hmm. right now, one that we really need to be cognizant of, then I'd be looking at, okay, what are the metrics around this? Yes, we can talk about how great that would be from a feel-good factor, we can talk about the science, but let's also talk numbers as well. So if we're putting a trial in, for example, you know, with a chief happiness officer or you know, chief wellness, let's look at where the economic principles come in. So we've embedded that also within um, the program and the work that we do. So if I'm, a, if I'm an organisation and I'm bringing in the concept or the theory around the chief happiness officer and I'm just about to go through a major change change management um, initiative. Does that chief happiness officer play a role in that? Is it embedded within like things like our change management, things like operational execution, logistics, compliance? Does the chief happiness officer get embedded into that or do they sit external? Yeah, and I, and I think that's a good question for a number of reasons. The first one for me is the chief happiness officer chief wellness officer for me is it's a title yeah if we unpack that a little bit more we're actually now talking about a framework yeah so yes the chief happiness officer may help to embed those things and from a, um, an organizational perspective internally they would embed those but let's go back from that we're actually talking about putting together a wellness and happiness framework which that's what you know the change management piece is about. Yeah. So going to your question is what we, what we would do from a change management perspective. It's not the officer, it's the framework. So it's putting a, a framework of wellness, corporate wellness, and yeah. also hand together. And then we embed that. Now we have to do this very differently with different organizations mm. depending on whether they've never had any form of corporate wellness and happiness programs or whether they're quite advanced in that and when then we do the wraparound. So really, it's not so much the person, it's the framework and the plan that goes along with it. And it's a systematic plan that we put in place um, to embed this within the change that's required for the organisation. So the framework sits as a key responsibility potentially for each and every leader within an organisation? Because Absolutely. of the because of the benefits and engagement, yeah, and and we think about it as a pillar for performance. So think about you know your roles and those that are listening to the podcast. Think about your individual role now, whether you sit at board level, whether you sit at C suite, mm. whether you sit for operations. It actually doesn't matter. 
what we're suggesting is that we're looking at the, the mental wellness piece in particular within organisations. We all have a responsibility. This does, doesn't sit with HR. So if there's a HR representative listening now, this is not solely on yeah. your head. This is on all of our heads. So what we're suggesting is that the corporate wellness and happiness becomes a core pillar to performance. So we start wrapping KPIs around this, for example. You know, we talk about the gross national happiness of countries, and that's something, you know, Bhutan, and you, you'll hear a lot of evidence around that um, yeah. from different countries. But what we're trying to do is embed that gross national happiness, but within organisations. Wow. It's, um, why has it taken so long, Belinda? <laughs> oh, the million dollar question. <laughs> if, I, if I had a dollar for every, um, you know, every time I, I, also I think myself, why is this taking so long? Look, I, I'll be honest with you, we've just written an article on this. Okay. I think there's a lack of understanding around the happiness movement. Yeah. I know when I first started studying, um, you know, my PhD, for example, and particularly if I go back five or 10 years, it was seen as a bit of a, you know, a softer topic. And mm -hmm. without rocking the fact that there is, you know, the psychology, the neuroscience, you know, understanding the brain and human behavior, it's a huge topic. And I think it's a lack of understanding and also, do you remember we all talk about this busy culture? Mm. And you know, it's a word that we actually we banned. We, you know, we yeah. don't use it. We're engaged. We have, you know, we're, we've got a lot going on, but we don't suggest busy. I think what's actually happened is yes, there's a perhaps a lack of understanding. And also this busy culture has taken over where it hasn't become a core focus. Yeah. Whereas now 2020 people are actually starting to, to step back and think, well, actually, my health and wellness is not just at home. Mm. It's now in the workplace. So, you know, how can we be part of that, you know, and, and working towards creating the happiest workplaces in the plants? Because it starts with you and I, Tony. Yeah. It starts with every single person that's at home now, uh, listening to this or driving in their car or maybe that's listening from the office. It starts with us. We need to start the movement. Yeah, absolutely. I've seen a lot of stats in relation to the concept of engagement in organisations. And the ones that always, the one that I'm most familiar with was um, we've got 20% of our team that are highly engaged. We've got 20% of our team that are highly disengaged. And then in the middle, we've got this 60% of people that, yeah, at varying stages of engagement and disengagement. Um, so engagement studies have been around for, you know, decades, I'd imagine. And it, I, I suppose, is it because, I mean, I, I think there's a, a leadership development issue in that a, a lot of the uh, frontline leaders aren't getting necessarily the training that they need to be able to fully engage their teams and their, and their leading the best way that they can because they haven't received that development. But what, what is the, like, like one of my continued frustrations around this piece is that a lot of um, senior leaders don't get the, um, the, align, the link between engagement and productivity and performance. Yeah, totally agree with you. And that's obviously for a number of reasons. If you think about, you know, our role as leaders, mm. you know, we do, we, we do accounts. So, you know, we're, we're involved in the financials, the numbers, yeah. you know, we're involved in the compliance piece. You know, if I look at some of the, the more complex roles that I've had over the years, yes, of course, we have CFOs and marketing officers and we have all of those support, yeah. but really stops with us and we have so many hats now i'm not making excuses here but i'm suggesting that we have so many hats and in yeah. any given day and you'll know through your role tony as well that you know you'd have the hat on that is you know the cfo hat then you'd have the marketing yeah. then something would go wrong and it would you would have the compliance and safety hat on in any given day we would be wearing five six seven eight multiple number of hats so whilst I don't use that as an excuse or an out, what I'm suggesting is that we, you know, we need to look at, yes, are we supporting our leaders? 
but at what point is this starting to be embedded within our day? Yeah. And rather than it being a separate hat that we put on, I'm suggesting that we embed this as a core principle and a yeah. core framework tool that we measure as leaders. If we're able to measure the gross happiness of a country, why can't we? And I would want that as a yeah, CEO. Absolutely. Ability, are my team happy? Are they engaged? And, you know, that's one of the things that we're finding through our happiness at work survey that we developed is exactly this. is It's the accountability piece. We're not doing it as a, you know, as a carrot and a stick for leaders. Mm. We're suggesting that as a leader, let's truly look at, and I'm not just on about an engagement survey that gets sent yeah. out every 12 months and it's a, a tick box for compliance. Yeah. I'm just, only on a, you know, so if there's anybody that's listening to you know to this podcast now is you know it's that accountability holding ourselves accountable for the happiness and wellness of our workforce not just another hat that we slide on and slide off let's yeah. make it a core principle of who we are as leaders you know. i was just about to say it can't be a tick and flick it's got to come from that place of genuine care and empathy for our team and uh, a real desire to do it. I, I always talk to leaders about being conscious and intentional. And, you know, when we have our people there as, as our main priority, because if we look after our team, they're going to look after our clients, they're going to look after our customers, which in turn looks after our business. So it becomes a, a bit of a rolling sort of a, an aspect. And But um, it can't be a tick and flick because when it's a tick and flick and and we, yeah, I've done my dose of happiness for the day or my dose of safety or whatever it is um we um we're missing the point because it's got to come from that place of genuine care and um i'm I'm glad you talked about the soft skills aspect because one of the things that you know i I, i've got a deep-seated belief around is that you know, people say, oh, that's a soft skill, but the soft skills are the hardest skills. I mean, and I can be trained to in any sort of computer science or how to build a computer. It's it's a lot more challenging for people to be trained to be more effective and actually genuinely care about people if that's not necessarily part of their makeup. So I think soft skills, the hardest skill that a leader needs to master, but they have to master it if they want to get the best team and the best culture and and in turn have the best performance yeah totally totally agree and and i want to challenge yourself and everybody listening to this podcast today to look at the way in which we frame the word soft skills now i'm not just talking about rhetoric Mm. changing names for the sake of changing names but i'm suggesting that we now use essential skills so Mm. soft and hard skills yeah the reality these are now essential skills for 2020 and beyond. We, you know, we've got automations happening. We've got robotics. You know, we've got, um, you know, automations of organizations occurring. So one of the focus for, for us as an organization when we talk about, you know, evolving workplaces and the work that we do, I'm challenging leaders and I'm challenging, you know, people that we work with. Mm. These now as essential skills. And, you know, that's something that we're in conversations with with universities about embedding this within a university framework. Because we've been finding now leaders, we have a challenging role, an incredibly challenging role, but we also have the best roles. You know, we can make a difference to people's lives. We can make or break people. And we know we've all had those leaders that we've worked with that unfortunately have broken people, you know, have genuinely damaged people. So we've got to take a step back as leaders. And also for those that are listening that are perhaps aspiring leaders is when you're stepping up to that next level, placing people at the core of what you do. Um, There's a a great movement, um, the best workplaces to give back in Australia. And it's across the world, by the way, there's other ones. And what I love about the work that they're doing is it's focusing on um, giving back as the core of what you do. And, and we were very, very fortunate to be named as a top 40, uh, along with many other fantastic companies. And the reason why I think that is incredibly important is because we're putting giving back, we're putting kindness, we're putting people before profits. Mm. And I know there'll be some people listening to this, and they'll, but you can't do that. They'll be cringing so, as, they, as you speak. <laughs> And I get that because I sit in boardrooms, I sit on, you know, I yeah. sit on board, you know, and I do get people um, with these objections. 
But instead of necessarily putting one before the other, why can't we sit them alongside one another? Why do we have to take one or the other? Why does it have to be hard or soft skills? Why does it have to be people or profits? Why can't we sit them alongside one another? Yeah. And if we look at the, the metrics around you know, improving absenteeism, presenteeism, health claims, you know, the, the research done by PwC, this was back in 2014, you know, for every $1 that we can spend on well-being, you know, co companies are likely to return about the two, uh, $2 to two thirty. Now, that's obviously going to vary across, uh, across countries. But, you know, if, if, if we're still talking about profits, well, wouldn't an investment, you know, if I said to you, if you can invest $1, I can give you $2.30 mm -hmm. back over, you know, a period of time, three to six months and beyond, because these pieces don't take, yeah. um, and, and particularly with, um, you know, organizations that are going through a lot of challenges. So going back to your point that absolutely there will be people that are cringing, but I also want to flip the learning on that and that yes, it will involve an investment of time and money, but also the return on investment if you've got less presentation, which by the way, is, is really being invested probably heavily. Um, yeah world now because there's it's all about absenteeism but presenteeism in australia and a lot of the developed and developing countries by the way has dramatically reduced um, the amount of um you know the amount of productivity that we've got happening within organizations so yeah it, you know it's bigger picture you know a lot of you know a lot of bit of bigger picture pieces here so i like the the concept of essential skills and i I'm going to start using that term from now on. So your challenge has been accepted. Um, but interesting, as you were talking there, pictures of my grade six primary school teacher at Maroochydore Primary, Mr. Berry came to me. And when you're talking about genuine care and, and um, the aspects from the leaders, we've all got those people in our lives that have made that really positive contribution, that impact to us, you know, whether it's M Mr. Berry in my case that came to me then or whether it's someone that you've worked with, your first leader, your first manager, someone that believed in you, inspired you. We've all got that. Um, we've all got those stories. And so part of the, the I, I suppose, part of my thought process would be if every leader was the one that wanted to make an impact or genuinely cared enough to, to um, go out of their way to use their essential skills in developing better people. I, I, I think business leaders, management careers are all, all going to be so much better off for it. So. Yeah, absolutely agreed. And why wouldn't you want to create a flourishing environment for yeah. your team and for your business? Yeah. And, and you can, you can do that alongside profits. You can, we, you know, we've proven there's companies around the world that have based um, corporate wellness. They've yep. based happiness at the core of what they do. You only have to look to, you know, um, Tony Shea, unfortunately, um, you know, Tony Shea passed away at the, at the weekend. But, you know, Tony Shea and his book around delivering happiness. Yeah. Um, with Zappos, for example, you know, he placed the wellness of his team alongside profits. And by the way, he's one of the more high profile ones. There's many, many other yeah. organizations and corporates that, that we've worked with and that other organizations work with that are also doing this. You know, businesses that are starting the kindness movements, um, you know, the, the Bambuda group in, um, in Sydney, for example, they started the kindness movement. So you can have organizations that place happiness and wellness, flourishing environments at the core of what they do, and they are highly and incredibly successful and profitable. Excellent. I've learnt over time that, you know, when, when I was a, a lot younger, I, I suppose I used to be a little bit judgmental around people saying, why don't you look after your team better? Why aren't you like that? And um, over time, I, I suppose I've matured my outlook, and I now know that people don't go out of their way to be, um, awful at work or bad leaders, then they're, you know, sometimes it's a lack of awareness. Sometimes it's a lack of, 
you know, and understanding training. Um, so there's, there's a whole range of things. So, so I guess it's about creating that awareness, creating the, the platform um, for them to experiment with its essential skills and to, um, to give them the opportunity to fall over every now and again, because it's not going to be an immediate fix, is it, as well? It's going to be a gradual... I've, well, it's not, some people are going to want to see change and impact straight away. But I guess it's not a quick fix. It's a more of a gradual evolution of um, empowered culture. Yeah, I 100% agree with you. And I think that's something that, you know, a key point from, from those listening to the podcast is this is this is like, you know, climbing Everest. And yeah. I know from, you know, I'm currently training to climb Mount Everest that, it is not a sprint. It's full of challenges. Yeah. We have crevices that we need to cross. We occasionally fall and then we will need to get back up again. But, you know, that's one thing that I've learned from my own journey to, to Everest, both yeah. the physical journey, but also as a leader. And by the way, nobody's perfect. It's what lessons can we take and what steps are we using to to be our own, you know, high performance leader, you know, creating flourishing environments, not just for the others in our team, but let's just take a step back from that. You know, what about our own mental mm. and physical well-being as well as leaders? You know, so we feel functionally effective in the workplace and feel happy. You know, we've also got to have those high levels of mental and physical well-being too. So if it, this is not just about our teams, this is about ourselves as leaders. You know, we can't yeah. sprint to the top of Everest. If you go up to the top of Everest in a short period of time, you know, your um, your, your hemoglobin levels, obviously the oxygen saturation yeah. levels drop so low that you wouldn't be able to. And why can't we use the similarities there? You know, lessons from the mountain and lessons for leadership is it absolutely isn't a sprint. We're climbing up to levels that many of us will never have encountered before. Mm. Our body, our mind have never. Look at 2020. We're encountering things of our generation that we've never experienced before and we most probably will never experience again. So this is not just about the wellness of the teams. It's not yeah. just about the company. This is also fundamentally an incredibly important aspect for us as leaders, our mental health and wellness has to come first because we cannot fall from an empty cup. Absolutely. And I suppose now is it makes it even more relevant that we're looking after ourselves and our teams um, based on what we have gone through in 2020. So, so you mentioned Tony, Tony Shea, was it? Who else has inspired you in your leadership journey, Belinda? So many people look, it's really interesting. What what I've done is is I draw from people from a multiple um from multiple industries. So yep. I don't just look in the corporate world, you know, as a mountaineer and extreme adventurer. I also look to you know, some of the great sherpas that we have um over in, for example, in, in Nepal that we're yep. connected to. Some of the, the strengths and characteristics that they have as leaders on a mountain, uh, there's a huge amount of leaders on a non-mounting environment yeah. that we draw from. Um, I also draw from different types of industries as well, so not just one particular field. Um, you know, researchers around positive, um, you know, positive psychology, Sullivan, Dr. Martin Sullivan's work, for example, um, and Dina's work, there are so many phenomenal researchers. So what I like to do is I like to draw from a broad sector. And the reason why, you know, from research, from a sport environment you know from yeah. peak performance perspective and then obviously from the wellness space and happiness space because I think that's important as well is to be that well-rounded leader you know I, I read almost 200 books a year and, and I do that because I want to learn and I'm always curious yeah and I think you talk about inspiration I draw inspiration from every single person I meet. You know, when we've had this conversation, and Tony, today, uh, you know, I will go away and just jot a few notes down from things and experiences that I've, you know, I've brought from listening to yourself. And so every, when you talk about inspiration, I have to say, I also draw it from the, the really terrible experiences and the terrible, um, you know, leadership also that I've seen. Yeah. What are they doing? 
how can we improve it? So yeah. I hope that answers your question. On yeah, it thing. does. It does. And you, it leads perfectly to my next question, which is all about your book. So what are you currently reading? And, and then I guess what is the book that's had the biggest impact on you? Such a great question. Look, I, because I'm in the middle of writing a book, I've purposely chosen to look at such a broad sector of books. And so I use Audible, for example. Okay. And I you know, go through some of the books that I think have been really inspirational. Look, the Delivering Happiness book has been fantastic. Okay. And it was catalyst um you know for the chief happiness officers book that i'm currently writing because it was it, it, it's good to look at what other organizations are doing but it's also good to see what um, other like i mentioned before mm. sectors thing. you know if i look to my my library it's quite fascinating <laughs> In my Audible, you know, I've got the happiness equation and, um, you know, I've got psychology of human performance, all of those types of things. Um, you know, the marshmallow effect was always a good one as well. The silver method, you know, absolutely fantastic by Robert Stone. Um, Kintasugi was a really fascinating book. Um, you know, a lot of the work by Jack Canfield, for example, yeah. and the success principles has also been um, has been great but I just wanted to share a really interesting book um, that I read quite some time ago that um, I actually think some of the le- you know some of the listeners would be incredibly interested in and it's called when the air hits your brain so it's by Frank T Vertisic okay a doctor, yeah neuroscientist so if anybody's listening, obviously, you know, turn to the Chief Happiness Officer's book. Of course, you'd have yeah. to you have a look at Delivering Happiness by Tony Shea, but also have a look at, you know, more broadly have a look at like when, they, uh, when the air hits your brain, which I've read twice now. Wow. So, Such a so unique it's... title, When the Air Hits <laughs> Your Brain. Yeah. I, for a second there, I thought it was going to be another mountaineering sort of a book there. <laughs> so, as you're coming back down, but... But anyway, so what's the vision for you, Belinda, going forward? I think creating, you know, the movement that is creating the happiest workplaces in the world is a big one. Yeah. Uh, it's a huge one for us, and it's one that we're absolutely tackling, you know, some of the biggest mountains in the world and some of the biggest goals in the world. So my vision is to bring as many people as we can and one million and one people on the journey with us. Because, look, Tony, we know we can't do this mm. on our own Neither do I want to. You know, yeah. So we're looking at building that, that network of people around us that also want to go on that journey with us, both directly, you know, in, involved in clarity in our work, and indirectly, you know, to take this message more broadly. This is bigger than me. This is yeah. bigger than our organization. This is life-changing. And as leaders, we have the ability, you know, to change people's lives for the good. So when you ask about vision, you know, that is my vision to take this movement globally and, you know, make sure that it's not just about one person doing this. This is about making a change in the world. And And that's going to be such a positive impact. So thank you for doing that. It's going to be an awesome journey to watch and I'm really excited. Um, Hopefully let's stay connected and I'd love to have a chat with you in a year's time to see how it's going. And this is your final question. So is there anything that I haven't asked that I should have asked? I think it was how can everybody, the question would be is how can people be part of it? And I don't just mean through the work that we're doing now. And the, the answer would that is that we've all got the opportunity to make a change now. Yeah. So, you know, my, my answer and my question would be, how can you be part of the change? You know, be the change that you want to see in the world. You know, so if, you, if you're sat now with anywhere where you can grab a pen or paper, I would suggest what is an action that you could do today to be that change? to either be that leader or an aspiring leader? And how can you embed happiness and wellness into, into your own life, but also into the life of others? Yeah. So that's pretty much the question I would ask is, you know, how can others be part of this? 
couple of challenges you've set us, Belinda. It's always good to see. So how can people connect with you if, they, if they've listened and they've resonated and they want to make a difference? How can they connect with you? Oh, that would be, that would be an absolute blessing. We'd love to hear from people as well. I would suggest connecting with us on LinkedIn, so Clarity Groups on LinkedIn, or obviously please visit, you know, my own profile. We're on Facebook. You know, we have a Happiness at Work Facebook where we give away free content. You know, we want this movement to go viral. So yeah. Facebook, LinkedIn, head over to our website, claritygroup.com, and it's Clarity with an I, not yeah. a Y at the end. So yeah, please, please help us, you know, join the movement and let's, you know, let's create the happiest workplaces in the world together. Absolutely. And I'm part of that Happiness at Work Facebook group, um, being part of that society, um, that group, and it's been um, absolutely inspiring and motivation, motivating to be in part of that. So I will have those links in the show notes as per always, Belinda. It's been an absolute pleasure talking with you today. I am so I get so excited talking about people that want to make an impact that are going to be create uh, change positive change within the world because can I tell you after the year that I think we've all gone through we need some positive change and so so thank you very much for everything that you do and thank you for your time today. Thank you so much and absolutely wishing you huge success in the work that you're doing as well. It was an honour to be part of the podcast and I wish everybody well that's listening today and thank you. Join the group of people impacted by seriously simple stuff to get you unstuck. The first book by Tony Coach Curl. Available at Amazon, Tony's Simple Stuff provides the tool for people to master your life and aspirations. 20% of every book sold supports Carter's cause. Unlocking team member engagement is one of these perennial questions that organisations should be asking. It's one of the biggest questions that they face in the global um, workplace of the future. And if they aren't asking, should be asking. Now, engaged team members are at least, and research continues to show this, are at least 20% more effective, 20% more uh, productive, and stands to reason that due to this, their results and their outcomes will increase as well. This should be on the to-do list for all leaders and not simply accepted as a cost of doing business, which is what far too many leaders unfortunately do. They write off people and they just accept poor performance or underperformance um, or present um, ism as Belinda spoke to as a necessary cost of doing business. And that's why the development of essential skills is paramount for businesses everywhere. And I love the way that Belinda framed people skills as essential skills and not as the soft skills that many people uh, phrase them as or term, uh, term use the term soft skills when they're talking about people skills. They're essential skills. And I've always stated that soft skills are indeed the hardest skills that people can manage and lead. And they are the hardest skills to master. Acknowledging them as essential skills helps build the importance for them for business life and ongoing education of of our future generations. So how can you develop the essential skills that you require for life and in business? Now, of course, in the show notes, I've got the links there to Belinda's uh, LinkedIn profile, the Happiness of Work Facebook group, and the Clarity Group website, which as we speak was currently being revamped and under uh, under construction. So that's our final interview show for 2020. We will be back with more great leader leaders interview in 2021. Stay tuned for our Christmas show, our annual Christmas show, And a show that we will do on New Year's Eve where we'll start to shift your focus into the year ahead if you haven't already done so. And even if you have done so, maybe we'll give you some tips and advice on some things that maybe you haven't thought of. Um, 2021 is certainly a rebuilding year for many, um, whether it's our careers, whether it's our leadership development or whether it's our business. It is certainly will be seen as a year where hopefully the world, the globe, will start to rebuild into something that resembles success for all. 
In today's disruptive world, good leadership skills will always stand you in great stead. Now, if you're looking to build those better leadership skills, please check out the Today's Leader website at todaysleader.com.au. Our website showcases the podcast and the magazine, and we're pleased to say that our masterminds are now available. Supported by our network sites, Today's Leader is a collective mindset For the leaders and entrepreneurs of today, forging the path of success for tomorrow. The mindset to make a difference, the ability to create an impact. Think and Grow Business hosts our Today's Leader Masterminds. Think and Grow Business, where we focus on personal, professional and business growth. Book your free 30-minute discovery call right off the homepage at thinkandgrowbusiness.com. The Coach Curl Academy has over 75 programs to help you build a better you. Join for just $1 for the first month. The Academy equips you and enhances your mindset, your leadership, and your business. Check it out at thecoachcurlacademy.com. We also currently have an amazing lifetime offer, once again, available right from the front page. Don't forget, you are standing stronger, braver, and wiser And whatever you do, don't ever forget the golden rule. Yes, you know what that is. Just don't be an arsehole. I'll see you all again very soon. 